that my mental health has been challenged in the last 12 months more than it has ever been challenged in my life, 100%. Um, however, I think that so many people can say that. And I think that the one thing that I have had that so many other people haven't had and the one thing that we've had in, in, in healthcare, and again, the, the other thing that I would say is I think hospitals have had it a lot harder than general practice, a lot harder than general practice. So they've really been at the, the coal face and the face to face treatment of sick patients with COVID. Dr. Mike, Mike Banner, how are we? I'm oh, very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I've had an eventful day, but we've already discussed that uh, off off audio beforehand. But to kick things off, as I ask every guest, as concisely as you possibly can, who is Mike Banner? He is, oh no, I talked about myself in the third person. I am. You defaulted to that. That's... He is. He is. I am. Um, a GP for the NHS who uh, loves talking about mental health lifestyle and behavioural change and snacks that's the most concise answer I've ever had so so concise I don't know which direction to go next but um, snacks let's focus on that no I'm kidding I'm kidding but no what what I uh, what I love about what you do is you manage to distill down information to a very digestible digestible sort of understanding for, for most people I think that probably comes from your skill as a GP I think what I'm interested to hear First of all, is is what led you down the path to wanting to study medicine, become a GP? Was it a desire to help people? Was it an attraction to the financial benefits, or was it the traditional you become a doctor, or a lawyer, or whatever other profession your your parents decided for you at a young age? Well, a bit of all of the above, to be honest. I mean, I I, I was always um, a bit more academic focused in well, a lot more academic focused in school. I was terrible at anything to do with sports or practical skills or anything like that. My dad was a doctor, my mum was a nurse. So I had this automatic kind of understanding and insight into what a career as a doctor was like. Um, but naturally, as with most kids, I was sort of a bit determined to try not to do um, what just simply what my dad did. So I really wanted to work in a record shop, which obviously knowing what we know now would have not been an excellent career since they don't really exist anymore. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I kind of toyed with the idea of doing law and stuff like that just to be different. Um, but then I did work experience as a teenager and I, again I was like desperate like please give me the record shop I just want to work in a record shop and they gave me the hospital I was like oh, damn it I thought my dad might have bribed them or something like that um, but I actually really enjoyed it I just really liked just being among people talking to people finding out about you know what what was the matter with them and trying to figure out ways to fix it um, and it was just, you know, like a lot of it was that it was a bit of the path of least resistance because it was what I understood most about the world. I sort of, you know, it was what I had seen in my life. I didn't really know what a lawyer did. I'd watched, you know, programs about lawyers on TV, but I suspected that they weren't particularly realistic. Um, and I just, yeah, it was a, it was, it was a mixture of things. But you know, it it makes it sound like I'm not massively passionate about it or that I wasn't that interested in it. But that's not the case. I just genuinely loved it. Um, and just carried on loving bits of it and still love bits of it and don't love other bits of it. But I think that's the same with most jobs, really. I think so. I think so. What you said there that's interesting is that part of it's the engagement with the people that you enjoy and then part of it's the figuring out what's wrong with them. And given that you see so many patients, given that, I mean, the, the amount you've seen in your career thus far must be in the thousands, tens of thousands, I guess. And do you, to a degree... Is it hard to continually humanise people when at the end of the day you're almost just solving problem after problem after problem and that seems to be something that you enjoy, the problem solving element, but is it hard to make sure that you treat every individual as a human being rather than just another patient coming through the door? Um, I would say that was something that I found hard until I did general practice. <clears throat> One of the things that I noticed like when I worked in the hospital is that these these people in all of these beds were all they were all dressed the same they were all wearing these hospital clothes and they were all you know patients with blood pressures and with blood results and with you know medications and, and problems and diagnoses and I remember the first time that I saw a patient dressed and ready to leave the hospital and it was a real shock to me and I know this this might sound really strange but it, was, it was you know I just qualified as a doctor um, and I looked at this this woman and suddenly 
she was not this person in the bed anymore she wasn't this diagnosis she was you know an old lady wearing all of her normal clothes with holding her handbag ready to go and I was like oh, you know like it, it was really strange to kind of compute the difference whereas in general practice because you know I, I see people fairly regularly so there will be people that I've there, there are people that I see now who I've known for 10 years so I've seen them when they've come in as a relative of someone else or I've seen them in the pub or at a restaurant or you, you know walking in the street and it, it's a different kettle of fish I think in general practice and it does make it much easier to humanize people because you know they might be the receptionist next door neighbor or their cousin or something like that and it it it, it, it just it there's a there's a certain amount of context that I feel like you don't always get to see in hospital not that you can't see it not that I think hospital doctors don't think of that context but I think it's just much harder to contextualize people when they have essentially just been you know made entirely generic almost by this situation by even like the clothes that they're wearing and everything so would you say that becoming a gp was is, is that where you see the most valuable part of your career thus far in medicine is that what you value the most well massively but i you know if i didn't say that then something would have gone terribly wrong because that's kind of the final <laughs> the final part yeah. of my path so if i'd worked all that time to get to, to be a gp and then i you know i didn't think that then then you know I, i'd have to change i think but yeah ultimately i would say that it, it, it interests me because because as you said one is one is almost more data led um to a point you could you could very easily as you said in the hospital that's why i ask because it i've heard people say in the past that the transition is very stark in terms of you actually get to know people rather than just what their clipboard says what what the input of the data you're monitoring says so it's uh it doesn't surprise me no no knowing you that the human side of things is what makes you thrive but i think what fascinates me is how balanced you are and i think that comes from the conversations you have with pa patients across the board so when it comes to being able to discuss things like fat loss like calorie intake like nutrition online that's where you're excellent because you've heard it from a lot of people that suffer with these things on a day-to-day -day basis and I'd just be interested to hear from you what you would highlight as the the most the most common misconceptions that come up for you around general health and well being on a day to day basis. Oh gosh, I mean, th there's so many, and I think that the fact that there are so many is, and and uh, you know, I I consider myself massively fortunate to have all these conversations with people, and I think that it's where. I think that the reason that sometimes it's hard for people like in the fitness industry and stuff to, 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 to have that level of balance is not because there's anything the matter with them or what they do or their own understandings. I think it's just that by definition, most of the people in the fitness industry work with people who are engaged in lifestyle change and stuff like that because they've decided to come and see a coach, for example, or they've decided to join a gym. So they've kind of often done those initial bits whereas a lot of the people that i see is something that i'm trying to bring up to them um and so they may have absolutely no interest in it no background in it no sort of level of intention of, of doing anything so it, it's often a very very different conversation um and it means that i guess i'm sort of somewhat privy to you know when, when you've had that conversation you know why why don't you just do this and then somebody actually tells you why they just don't do this and you go oh yeah no actually that's that's fair <laughs> you know <laughs> and so it you kind of and i you you just get a bit more of an understanding of of actually no you know this whole we've all got the same 24 hours in a day actually we very much haven't and i'm de i'm shown that every day whereas you know like if 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 you're a personal trainer who's got clients who are coming to to see you at 6am before work and their attitude is, well, we've all got the same 24 hours in the day, hence I'm here at the gym booking a personal trainer. Then if you're surrounded by that sort of attitude, of course you're going to think that, that there isn't another side to that story. Um, so it's absolutely no, um, you know, no, no negativity towards anyone who kind of has that attitude because I get why they do. I've had it before myself, but it's just that I'm lucky enough to, to you know, to have my own bias is shoved in my face and go you're wrong um which is quite humbling and, and also empowering at the same time but to answer your question which i've just rambled about for ages because i'm not really sure what the answer is 
Um, I, I just think that, that when it comes to, I think the biggest thing is that in order to effect lifestyle change or to improve your own life through lifestyle change, you have to do awful and miserable things that will make you sad. Um, and that it, it crushes me because I thought like that, that was what stopped me from doing it for a long time. Um, and I thought you really needed to suffer in order to do these things, like down to the fact that like, you know, I actually think that I thought that exercising outdoors in the cold and rain, which I absolutely hated, was somehow better than just exercising in a gym inside in comfort because, you know, you're suffering more, so it's good for you, you know, like, and actually that, you know, there's certainly a place for like resilience training. There's certainly a place for doing things that you don't want to do. Like I'm, I'm all for that, but it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent like that. They, you know, there are ways of, you know, when you're less motivated, for example, of doing, doing slightly less for ultimately more gain long-term than, than pushing it at a hundred percent and then giving up after three days because it's so awful. Yeah, it's almost mi micro dosing the suffering, isn't it? Because it, 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 the amount of uh, funny stories I've heard from my parents' generation that talk about oh, just getting up at four a.m. to exercise because that somehow inherently made it harder and therefore inherently somehow made it better when there's no physiological reasoning to support that. But you now get in the sea every morning because it's cold and miserable, but you equally enjoy it. And I know that you ha you you have access to a personal trainer that you book in and, and spend time with, but it's not all it's not always all singing, all dancing. I want to be here. Let's go again. Is it? It's no. And and this is kind of like there is a there is a part of me that that I do I do sort of heavily push that kind of content a, a little bit intentionally as well. Partly because it's just my natural tendency to whinge about stuff, but also because when I wanted to get into fitness, all I ever saw was like intensely motivated and driven people being really hardcore um and i think that that is great and it's inspiring but sometimes it's a bit disempowering because it's sometimes it's a bit like well i don't think i'm ever gonna be like that and it's a bit like when i was at medical school like when you see all these really driven people studying really hard and like working 24 hours a day i was never that guy like i was always the person that just did the minimum effective dose of what I needed to do to get done and like you know left everything to the last minute crammed it all in at the end and like prayed loads that I would somehow pass my exams and like I guess that there is just this you know some people are those people and some people are less like those people and I, I kind of I'm, I'm here for the people that think that they can't achieve stuff because they're not that person and i just want to say like actually you can achieve loads you don't have to you know you don't have to be intensely driven and motivated but i mean not that i'm not i i like this is the other thing is i don't want to kind of blindside it as well i am quite driven i am quite motivated but i still hate doing it like i, I know what i want to achieve but I don't want to do a split squat. Like it's horrible. No, the, the, it's so the, the, there's, there's no a, the, joy in a split squat. There's a big squat. camp. There's a big camp of people online that are with you on that, myself included. However, I've managed to somehow rewire my genetics to convince myself it's a good idea. Um, but I think it's every, every achievement's relative as well, which I think is very easily lost sight of in in the society in which we live, whether that's financial job title, fitness, broader elements of it, it's a completely relative term and progress Absolutely. tomorrow is better than going backwards today. It's not a phrase, it sounds like it could be, um, but I think you know what I mean. It's just a case of incremental steps are better than doing nothing, but the barrier to entry is often raised very, very high because of those intensely driven people that you often see yeah. suffering and doing the things that you don't think you'll ever be able to do, but simply walking 100 meters further tomorrow is better than yeah. walking 100 meters less um oh totally I, constant imperfect actions are ultimately in my opinion what yield the best results and i have to say i've done i've done both i've done you know i've been like paleo and done like super extreme diets and all of that kind of stuff i nothing <clears throat> has ever been as effective and consistent as those slow and gradual changes and and little little incremental things that I've been able to sustain um, and even when I've done the really hardcore stuff I haven't even even in the time that I did it I haven't particularly made 
better progress than I did when I was doing the normal stuff. So it's been it's been a big lesson to me to try and, you know, to try and understand that myself. And it's something that I just kind of want to pay forward because I think so many people don't just don't think they can do stuff because they think what is involved in it is too much. And I hate those memes that say stuff like, everyone wants to be a lion but no one wants to do what the lion does and it's like a picture of a lion with blood on its face and i'm like what what's the matter with you like why what this what? is why i as somebody who a lot of people would very much assume is a total fanboy but why i i mean i've never used the phrasing as aggressively as this but i despise goggins's mentality because it's just pure perpetual suffering when in reality it doesn't need to be like that. And yes, I'm a big fan of people building their resilience and people pushing themselves beyond their boundaries, but it, it's relative to current output. It's relative to how far you need to grow. And for most of us, it's not fueled by the same level of trauma as it is for that man. And I think that is in the fitness, in, in my my own individual echo chamber, as we've discussed already, that the people I'm exposed to, there's so much, there's so much overworking, overanalyzing, when in reality, the minimum effective dose is actually the most effective way to progress towards the goals that the average person wants to achieve because we're not all running the Moab 250 like Goggins is, but we want to be like him because he looks cool online. And I'll definitely flag some questions for saying this, but there it is. It's out there. I And I use the word despise. <laughs> this is the thing. Like I, 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 to be fair, I, I've not really looked into Goggins stuff because I kind of, I've seen sort of snippets of it and I kind of think like, I'm just not very good at taking that sort of stuff super seriously, which is, you know, my own sort of disadvantage in, in some ways. But um, I I think that there is just this tendency, particularly in fitness, that sometimes what we're not after is fitness. What we're after is superiority. We want to feel like we are better than other people, actually. And and I think that sometimes that creeps through into into what so many people do. When, when people are passionate about anything, they want to be the most passionate about it. They want to be the elite of whatever it is that they do. Um, and actually, like, you know, you see it, you see this kind of glorification of suffering, like the hashtag hustle, the hashtag grind. I was up at 4 a.m. this morning. Yeah, well, cool, but why? You didn't need to be, really. You could have probably achieved everything that you wanted to. And this is why I find it so interesting now that suddenly a massive new thing in fitness is getting enough sleep. So now everyone is like having their mind blown because they're like, oh my God, what do I do? Do I wake up at four or do I get enough sleep? Which is which is more alpha, which is more hashtag hustle. Um, and then now you've got people, actually I do this as well, but like posting their sleep scores. And it's like now they're, they're, they're like resting harder than you as well. Like I'm better than you at everything. My, my um, day strain is higher, but my rest yeah. recovery score is higher than yours. <laughs> exactly. It's just absurd, isn't it? Yeah, and it, but, it's, but it isn't. And this is the thing is, it's actually not absurd. It's, it's so easy to get swept up in. And like I say, when I, you know, I, I grew up overweight, inactive, completely disinterested in nutrition, completely disinterested in my own physical health, um, in exercise, in anything like that. And then I lost a bit of weight and suddenly I became that guy as well, you know, eyeing up what people were eating, going, oh, there's carbs in that, you know. You know, like, it, it's so easy to get caught up in it because you also, everyone inherently has this secret desire to be part of that club. Um, and when they see everybody succeeding by being part of that club, it's very difficult not to try and be it themselves. And you sort of, you know, you end up almost, you know, just emulating your echo chamber i suppose a little bit and and thinking that that is the way to achieve things so again you know we say this but it's no it's no disrespect to anybody who's doing any of this stuff because it's easy to do and it might be what's right for those people but it just might not oh, yeah I, I agree i think i think the, the caveat you've put there is what i probably should have caveated my earlier statement with and that i think it's it's the narrative that you adopt should be relative to where you are and where you want to get to rather than just blindly following an ideology because you think it's cool and i think that's that's the biggest challenge i mean i don't get me wrong i i don't get enough sleep i train more than most people and i do things that are deemed quite silly by by most people but that's because through trial and error i've learned that they're very valuable and self-fulfilling rewarding for me and there's elements of that that can be taken and applied to each and every person at a different scale so it's i try very much to avoid the ideological side of things because it can 
I don't, I don't want to create that sort of club mentality whereby because it can push people the other way as well. It can it can raise the barrier to entry so high that it feels that people can't even get started, and that's not something I want to push in any way. But what I want to go back to quickly is your innate desire at medical school to do the minimum amount of work required to get the results required to keep moving forwards. And is that was that a conscious decision based on happiness? Was it laziness or because it's, it seems to be the same way that you approach life now and you seem like a very content man as a whole. So I'm wondering whether it's a, a young enlightening that means that you wanted to not spend time doing things you didn't enjoy for no more gain or was it something else? No, it's laziness. It's laziness. It's okay. laziness. Sorry, I read too much into that. No, <laughs> I mean, I, I'd love to. I, I mean, I, I suppose I, I would love to claim enlightenment, but I, I just I never I've never been. Like I never liked work. Like work to me is what I'm trying to finish so I can watch TV. And I feel like I've kept very much in that like seven year old self mentality. Like you have to finish your homework and then you can watch. I used to watch, like, like this used to be the thing when I was a kid. Like you try and finish your homework by 5.30 so you could watch Neighbours. I remember Neighbours. Yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and and so it was kind of like that to me has always been like I'm trying to just get things done. And, and to be fair, like at school, I was I, I was a high achiever academically. Like I did really well in, in sort of GCSEs and A-levels. But I don't know that I worked harder than I needed to do to do really well. So to be fair, I still wanted to do really well. But at medical school, what changed was that suddenly you had to work really, really, really hard just to get like the pass mark. Um, and it no longer to me became about excelling. It became about just trying to like survive. So it, it was a slightly different approach. But I suppose I still, you know, still worked, I guess, the same amount. But I just wasn't I, I found it difficult to motivate myself to work without having that kind of, you know, dangling stick or whatever it is that if you fail the exam you lose your summer holiday because you have to reset it do you feel that medical school was inherently beneficial for you as a human being or was it just beneficial for the piece of paper and the qualification that has allowed you to develop your career because i know the answer based on my degree so i'd be interested to hear it from your perspective Question. I mean, I think, yeah, medical school is, I think, a bit of a different kettle of fish to most degrees because it's six years um, and there are parts of it that are, quite, that are quite intense. You know, like I got sent on placement to, I, w I was at medical school in London, but I got sent on placements to Stoke-on-Trent, to, to Devon. Um, so it was quite cool, even just from a, you know, from a understanding and learning a little bit about the country and about adult life. Um, because just having to go away and stay somewhere else that you don't even know for four weeks and, and figure things out, um, I suppose was was quite useful. I mean, from obviously from a social perspective, it was it was massive, um, and I I I loved it. But the, I I think my regret about medical school was that I thought I'd live in London forever, so I didn't really do anything. Like I I, I kind of keep thinking back and thinking, why did I like? I just stayed on the same road for like five years. I mean, we moved around and we were living in different places and stuff, but we never like got on the tube and went to central London and went to like a museum or anything or just went shopping like in Oxford Street if you needed to. You just didn't do it. It was really bizarre. And I think it was because we didn't want to pay three pounds to go on the tube. Um, so I don't know. It's really strange. It just, I took it for granted, I suppose, is, is the short answer. I think it would have been a lot more impactful but I think it yeah I think it the answer is it was impactful for my life as well as my career but yeah but mostly my career yeah I, I, it's interesting I, I expected as much because it's a much more formative experience and we were speaking beforehand I had maximum at peak six hours of contact with my university tutors etc a week and it got to the point where they weren't even relevant to the exam material so I was getting emails from a few lecturers being like why aren't you attending my lectures and I've been like because it's not relevant to the exam material and I don't want to leave the library yet here I am being told off for not coming to your lectures that just tell us about your work for no real reason other than to <laughs> groom your own ego it seems so it was just a very confusing experience for me in that sense and one that I look back on wishing I'd done things differently obviously I can't do but it, it's from a 
from a perspective now, it's something that I'm, I'm keen to sort of broaden the discussion on because I think um, the narrative on university and higher education as a whole is moving away from the traditional norms, which I think is a very beneficial thing for society as a whole and the mental health of younger teens and aspirational teenagers that now have as many options as they've ever had for a much more creative individual career. And I'm just interested to hear your take on that within the context of medicine, perhaps from the younger um, patients that you see on a day-to-day basis, whether you've noticed a parameter shift and how they're interacting with their own mental health, whether there are discussions you've had that have felt positive or whether it's a, a more negative overall experience for you at the moment. I mean, I, f- I feel like as a, as a general overall, the education system seems to, and I'm talking about it from, like from primary school level, seems to place a lot more of an emphasis on well-being than it ever has um whether that is translating or will in the future translate in future generations to an improvement in mental health i don't know um what i what i struggle to understand at the moment is whether people are becoming more in touch with their mental health or whether people are improving their mental health and i think there's a big difference and i think that part of part of you know the problem is I think back to when I grew up <clears throat> and there wasn't this sort of emphasis and there was this very much kind of mentality of, you know, just, just do it, just carry on, etc. And I don't remember being particularly well supported from a, from a mental wellbeing perspective, not necessarily like one aspect was that I, I don't know that I ever needed to be. The other aspect was that I, don't think I knew that the support was available if it was available. It may well be that if I had struggled and had asked for help, the help might have been there. So I don't want to say that that wasn't the case, but it wasn't It wasn't a proactive thing. Um, and I sometimes think that in a way, like realising that you're struggling, like actually sometimes if you don't realize that you're struggling because people don't tell you that you're struggling in a way sometimes that can have its own little micro benefits now i'm struggling to vocalize and articulate that properly because i don't what i don't want that to translate as is saying you know people aren't in touch with their feelings then they won't realize that they're you know that they're having a struggle but i kind of feel like sometimes there's so much focus on on are you okay and is everything okay that it, that i know that when people go are you okay i go yeah and then when people go are you really okay though i might go well actually and i might be trying to like you're almost trying to think you're of digging. things that aren't, yeah. aren't yeah. good in your life and i think that one of the problems that we do have is is the pathologizing of emotion um and it's kind of it, it, is kind of the counter side of you know this great thing that we're talking more about mental health and we're trying to destigmatize mental health and we're trying to get people to understand their mental health more but sometimes i worry that what we're doing in that process is over diagnosing over pathologizing and having people understand that you know depression means this so when i feel sad that must mean i i am depressed and and that worries me sometimes is that that kind of that we over we over pathologize emotion and it comes back to that whole sort of relentless positivity thing that we were talking about before even in fitness in that you know people talk about positivity and actually positivity isn't necessarily about being happy all the time it's about being able to 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 understand your feelings and to understand why and accept that sometimes you won't feel so great but actually the positivity comes in trying to figure out how to manage that and trying to work towards a solution and all of those sorts of things so it's really difficult because they're complex messages and it's a complex issue to get people to understand and it's hard to get people to talk more about it without then convincing more people that they have a problem does that make sense i i know exactly what you mean it's it's difficult to articulate you're right i think it's a case of it depends on the personality type of the person perhaps in the sense that if somebody is susceptible to overthinking and overanalyzing, maybe being a bit more anxious about certain things, they might think, oh, well, that symptom lines up with the way I'm feeling and therefore I must be X or Y. I should go to the GP and I'll just say, well, it could just be a period of this, but it could also be, oh, well, it must be that. It, 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 it's difficult because we live in a very convoluted, complicated, noisy world and it must be difficult to navigate 
our true feelings it's something i still struggle with am i am i just exhausted am i just having a bad day or is this a sign of something worse and even as somebody that's been aware of my depression and my susceptibility to it in the past these are still questions that i need to ask myself not because i'm afraid of talking about it but it's, it's how do i proactively move forward from here what, what what's the playing field i'm i'm operating on yeah, rather than I, I know what you mean and I, I also know why you're tentative to say it because it might it might sound like we shouldn't talk about it as much because there's a negative side, but it, it, yeah, you're 100% correct obviously. to bring it up. Not what and, I mean. No, no, no. I, I, I've had um, I've had somebody bring this up in my DMs before, actually. Um, somebody from Dundee who basically said that a big concern of theirs is that the environment is so working class where they are that even talking about these things is making people more aware that they might be even... I can't remember how he phrased it. It was basically even weaker than they already thought they were because it's attaching labels to it and things. And like, we kind of had a bit of a back and forth. And in honesty... Upon reflection, I feel I fell into the trap of lacking exposure to that perspective and therefore not being as empathetic to the reality of what he was trying to say. Whereas in my head, it kind of just came across as talking about mental health can have negative ramifications. I thought, well, it might do, but the pros outweigh the cons. But that's not the case for all of us. So it, it, it's, it comes back to the word balance, doesn't it? It's, it's how, how do we control the narrative and how do, how do we interpret and deliver the narrative? And more it's importantly, nuance, what 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 the people do with it, I think, is the main thing. It's nuance, and and you know, different people need a different approach, which is why, which is why things like you know, complex public health messaging on places like social media are such a minefield. Because actually, the reality is there will be some people that that do need a certain type of you know a certain message to be portrayed, and there will be some people that actually won't benefit from that message or you know in some cases not necessarily from this but there are some messages that might harm a small minority of people if, if taken the wrong way and, and and that's something that has to be kept in mind with with all of these things which is why you know you know when you see like public health sort of campaigns and stuff like that and you just think why on earth would they say that that's like that's the issue is though isn't it they're, they're aiming for the most common denominator there's probably an algorithm somewhere that takes census data and says what is the most average message we can deliver and nine times out of ten that message isn't going to land with anyone because it doesn't actually speak to the individuality of the person they're trying to actually target so i mean i think there's a big rabbit hole especially in recent times on public health messaging on social media and on on uh, bus stops in london specifically but for the sake of uh potentially your employer we probably shouldn't go down that rabbit hole <laughs> i think i'm technically self-employed but yeah it's, uh, okay okay yeah no, excellent. Move on. well well then <laughs> well, well then <laughs> off we go but no i think um one thing before before we dwell on more recent times i think something i'm very interested in from a just from a curiosity point of view is what has been is there a most rewarding moment of your career thus far that you can isolate or is it just the ebbs and flows of the job and there's moments where you'll be thrilled to be in the profession you're in and moments where you equally wish you'd, wish you'd done something else I think it's a bit like that I mean I, it, it's it's such a I, I could not think of a more humbling job because within the same several minutes you could have somebody breaking down telling you their deepest darkest secrets confiding in you something that they wouldn't trust to say to anyone else then you can have somebody who genuinely believes rightly or wrongly that you are the person who has saved their life um and then you can have somebody calling you terrible names and saying that you're stupid and that you know that it's your fault that something awful has happened or that you're ridiculous or that your practice is ridiculous i mean it's just it's bizarre so you, you <laughs> it doesn't let you get to too arrogant and then like five minutes later you're you're again then just being told to do something um as though you're just someone's assistant you know by by someone in another profession in another system and they send they send a letter going i've done this test you can check the results you know like any just like and then you're having a sandwich this, <laughs> exactly there's this just there's so much humility that it's really like and i, I like that because I think I don't, you know, like your job is to is to is to be with people and to talk to people and to help people, 
and it's you don't need to be any more arrogant than that like i i, I think that this is the this is the thing is that we're not doing anything special i actually one of the things that i've struggled with about recent times that that it has been the um like the nhs hero sort of rhetoric because i think it's i think it's really damaging from from multiple angles in the sense that i think it's bad to, for the public to think that we are heroes because we are just people doing jobs that we've chosen to do that we're being paid money to do um it's really bad for us to to convince ourselves that we're heroes and that for for two reasons one is that if we think that we're heroes heroes don't get paid heroes don't have nice working conditions and get regular breaks like you know batman and superman do not get regular breaks and so you know you kind of then set up this expectation that you have this you know duty to do what you're doing rather than that you're doing it as a job and you should be rewarded appropriately and have decent working hours and all of that sort of stuff but then also that you expect gratitude as part of your payment and actually i don't think that's either realistic or fair like actually you know that i think that that's part of the issue of it being a job is that this the job isn't about the person doing it it's about the person that you're doing it for um, and when when you're the hero in the room how can you you know like I just it it, it, it makes me feel icky and I, I really I hesitate to say it because I know it's so it's so well-meaning and, and it's so lovely that everyone's so grateful and honestly when people were doing the clapping like that first time that people were started clapping at eight o'clock and I could actually hear it from my house like in lockdown it intensely moving like it's unbelievable that that is that that has been so meaningful but at the same time i want to temper it with a i'm really grateful for that that's an absolutely lovely thing to do but i don't don't need you to do it for me i just you know like just don't call me an asshole <laughs> <laughs> meet in the middle i'm not a hero but i'm not an asshole yeah. do you think um do you think the majority of the NHS would disagree with you or agree with you on that? I don't know. I, I don't know that I've ever spoken for the majority of anybody. I can only speak for myself. And I think that's a really important thing to to say. I think that I, I know that I have a lots of friends and colleagues who feel similar. Um, but I also know that I use things like Twitter and like the the discourse and the disagreement between medics on Twitter is so fascinating. Like they, we are, it's not a cohesive body of the same people who think the same things. So I, I don't, I don't presume to speak for anybody. It's just my my sort of personal feeling, and it's it's the feeling of somebody who's, you know, who's done this for a long time, and who has made peace with the parts of it that will never change, um, and the parts of it that don't need to change because it's not what I'm doing it for if that makes sense yeah I know what you mean I know what you mean I think uh... <laughs> well one way to find out I guess <laughs> the passage of time but the something you said there which is that you don't speak for the majority something that you're aware of I think is something that the, the majority of Twitter and Facebook comment sections and everything has forgotten over the past 18 months. And I'm I'm just interested to get your executive summary of what it's been like as a GP within the NHS throughout the pandemic without wanting to go down too, too many details to start with. Just how has the experience been for you? Um, I would say overall, it's been quite difficult. Um, but for different reasons than I think people might expect. So, for example, and again, it like services range a lot regionally. So I can again, I can only even really speak for what happened locally to me. But at the start of the pandemic, there was I, I was absolutely terrified because I was worried that I'd be drafted back to the hospital. I would, you know, like you heard all this. We heard all the stories from Italy when when things were unfolding. Um, and we would, everyone was being told that we're three weeks behind Italy, so whatever's happening there is going to happen here, and it's going to be really awful, and everyone is going to die. Like that was that was kind of how I felt. I kind of thought that I was in danger in my job. I didn't feel like that I was going to be safe. We ran out of all of the, our PPE, and um, there was all of the fiascos and scandals about government 
processes to try and procure them and actually you know to be fair we didn't run out of them but we you know it was tough because we were making decisions we had to make logistical decisions do we keep the doors open do we lock the doors and i felt like a lot of the time we were making decisions that got made by the government a day later or got made by you know people a, a day later but because we had no choice but to try and figure it out for ourselves because it was all unfolding so quickly so as a like I'm a I'm a partner in a GP practice so I'm kind of responsible for running the service so it means that we have to make those sorts of logistical decisions as well um, and obviously guided by by the local you know guidelines and all that kind of stuff so um, that was really challenging and then nobody rang us at all like I was working in my practice and we had all we converted all of our all of our appointments to telephone appointments and the plan was that people would ring us and book in those telephone appointments and if we spoke to those people and they needed to be seen we would bring them down but we didn't know whether that would you know like we would do a risk assessment so basically like you know you're weighing up the risks of them coming to the practice versus them staying at home and you treating them over the phone so it was a really interesting and totally different way of practicing medicine because previously we would just be seeing people face to face. There was no, you know, it's just easy because you can see them in front of you. We started doing video consultations. We did all sorts. Um, like we, we, we worked fast to try and change things to, to, to manage it. And nobody, like I would have these whole clinics and like, you know, 16, 16 slots or so or 18 slots or something like that. And maybe four, five, six of them would, would get used and just people weren't people were, we people were falsely i think taking the message that it's closed everything is closed don't call your gp don't do anything so that was really worrying because then we suddenly were like what where is everybody what's happening what are we what are we missing now by by not seeing these people so then there was that side of things as well um did, that, did that thought didn't... did that thought come to you immediately in, in the oh, sense yeah. that did you start weighing up the, the, the almost the cost benefit analysis in some in some sort of sense of what what is the knock on effect of I mean this was still when COVID was killing everybody I guess in terms of the way you described it but was it very quick when you started weighing up the risk yeah. of coronary heart disease versus uh, obesity related disease versus this that and the other because that was something that I feel society the narrative was quite late in terms of actually well what have we been missing this entire time. Not not well, to not to discredit the initial first wave of COVID as it was obviously an enormous challenge for the UK and the, the rest of the world, but it, it, it's there's obviously the, the knock on effects of that that are equally yeah. there's been equal damage to loss of life in certain areas. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you know I think we were aware of it, and I think particularly in general practice, like so we we made a very conscious effort to because we were like, well, what are we going to do when it when it finishes? <laughs> you know, because at the time we thought it was going to be over in a couple of months, we were like, well. What, how, you know, if we don't do people's diabetic reviews now, when are we going to do them? Because we're going to be really busy soon. Like, you know, it, we need to keep things ticking over. So, you know, we did a lot of stuff that that um, you know that that I, I'm not sure everybody was doing, but we 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 took a real pragmatic approach to trying to trying to make sure that we were looking after everybody as best that we could in the context. And I think that it's a real vicious circle because the problem is, if you increase infections and you take up hospital beds with covid it's always going to have a knock-on effect of, on other things like i you know if you crash your car and there's no intensive care beds then what are you going to do with your you know what you're going to do with your, your broken leg that needs a, a massive operation or with your you know with your abdominal trauma or whatever so this is the thing is that that whether you whether by lockdown or whether by not being able to see a GP or whether by hospital beds filling up with COVID and or or all of the doctors and nurses having to self-isolate or having COVID, all of these things have a knock-on effect on patient care. So when everyone was going, oh, lockdowns are really bad because it has all these other negative effects, it's like, well, the only way to stop negative effects from happening is to have like a time machine and disinvent COVID. Like we haven't chosen this thing to have happened. We have just got to do the best that we can. So I think there was there was this pragmatic approach of understanding that, you know, like, and so every, you know, all of the doctors of social media were on there going, you know, guys, we're open. We still want you to contact us. We just might be, 
it might look a little different. We can still give you advice over the phone. We can still refer you to for investigations, but that they might be delayed. You know, like there was, there was still this kind of desire to try and, and do stuff. But I think that again, it, it comes, it comes down to public health messaging. People thought they shouldn't access healthcare. Like I'm still getting people ringing up now saying, oh, are you seeing patients yet? How and I was like, I have I have never at any stage stopped seeing patients throughout the whole of COVID. We might have had a slightly different threshold, and you might have had to have a phone call first, but it's never been that you cannot be seen if you need to be seen. But that you know, the word need is I think something that's quite difficult to contextualize in again in in public health because sometimes you don't need to see people, but they might benefit from them from seeing you. Um, but if they might then, you know, have other disadvantages to that in the process, it's quite difficult to marry up. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I would say personally, the most challenging part of the pandemic for me professionally is right now. Like actually when things have sort of gone back to normal and now there's much longer waiting lists at the hospital, people are waiting for, for procedures and operations that they've been referred for a long time ago. The demand for the service has gone gone back to, to you know to what it was before and then some you know in terms of stuff like self-care for simple conditions and stuff like that people were obviously managing these things at, at home for, for a long period of time and I think that um, it's sort of gone back to the way it was which was you know if you've got this symptom call your GP um, which is you know there's nothing wrong with that but it's just it's busier than it's than it has been I would say um, but the lovely thing about it is that it's you know it's it's it feels less bleak if that makes sense in terms of especially from a you know from a covid perspective um you know when we were in you know in january when things were really difficult that was that was tough from a you know from an emotional perspective and from a, a mental health sort of perspective for me because of the nature of the stuff that we were seeing and the fact that we were having you know covid problems professionally as well as personally as well as with patients and all of that sort of stuff as well so it's been hard because I think everyone's everyone's had their own everyone's had their own personal battles to be managing in this whole system whether it's related to having covid having loved ones with covid having other problems having lockdowns having mental health problems having financial problems job security problems like it's just it's never ending so you know, I think it's been it's been tough for everybody at different scales at different times. A hundred percent. And this 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 feels like an unfair question, but my intention is not to trap you. But <clears throat> excuse me, was there any stage throughout the process where you flat out disagreed with some of the measures the government were implementing from a, from a yeah, medical loads. point of view? Loads. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that it's, again, it's it's hard because sometimes you see, you see things, you see decisions get made and things that you need to comply with, which, you know, again, I think it's been tough because, because of the way that the government has, I think, either explained or sometimes not explained thing, I th things. I think it's been hard to understand why certain decisions have been made. Um, and some of them, like I, I, I know that sort of sometimes people uh, people have messaged me on Instagram and going, can you please explain to me why X, Y or Z about vaccines, for example? I can imagine and that would be chaos for you for the entire entire period of time. It's been interesting. Um, <laughs> and I'll say this and they go, oh, why didn't the government say that? And I was like, well, actually, some people in the government did, but the ones that were on TV didn't. You know, like it, so it's, it's been it's been quite difficult, I think, to to kind of get down to the basics of why stuff is being done. But I think, um, I think that, that, that for the most part, it, it's it, like the communication has been odd, but there have been, yeah, there've been quite a number of, of decisions that I've disagreed with, but, but some of them I've turned out to have been wrong about, like, you know, it, it's been, it's hard. Cause again, everyone has been approached like everything is easier in hindsight isn't it it's easy to look back and go up oh, that lockdown should have happened a week earlier especially especially in months. hindsight from behind the keyboard yeah, exactly, the uh, exactly the internet and specialty so, yeah and so again 
knowing the criticisms that are aimed at myself and my profession and knowing the answers to those when I look at other people who work in another profession and I think well maybe they know something that I don't know about that profession and there's a reason that they're doing what they're doing and I suppose there's a part of me as well that is like desperate to just believe that I don't have to worry about something because someone is is doing a good job and they're they're the man for the job they're gonna get the right answers I love that um I think that that one thing that has been really consistent for me is Chris Whitty I think he's been amazing like and again he has disagreed with certain things like clearly from his the subtext of what he said he's had concerns about certain decisions that have been made at certain times and I think he's been for the most part correct on most things pretty much throughout and I, I, I definitely don't envy his job I think that's been really tough but I think that's what's been interesting is there's a difference between listening to the scientists and listening to the government because they do say slightly different things and quite rightly this the government have a different agenda to the scientists because they're not just talking about healthcare they're talking about the um the economy and you know education and all of those sorts of things as well so they do have to take their advice from not just the scientists but from other specialists as well and whether whether or not that's been advice that they've taken or not i don't know because i that's not my sort of area of of great understanding i'm trying to be mildly diplomatic while also i think yeah i think you did a good job there, there were a few times i wanted to bust in and say little snide comments but i thought i, I just i just can. i just not it's all good i just not i'll, I'll keep them i'm used to it that's my fair share of snide comments over <laughs> no, not not to you but just to just a little bit about donors here and the, it just it just you know, oh well must, exactly yeah. and this is yeah absolutely and that's i, th I think yeah yeah it's, it's I'm, I'm not i'm not um i'm not here to question the the more agenda-driven side of the government that's that's no. not something we'll ever get to the bottom of but more just no. from a from a monitoring and the I, data it's just it was I interesting love, to hear your point of view and i love sitting in a little naive place where i just hope for the best and think things and i i'm a i'm a big rule follower as well so if there's if there's a rule i'm following it and and this is the thing is, is that i i get that people are different and people react differently to these things and so i understand why people people have reacted differently but I, and i've been very much you know, I think we have to, again, we, we have to accept our own, you know, what makes us feel comfortable. And I always feel comfortable, you know, the more rules I have, the easier I find to make decisions, which is, you know, which I find exhausting at the best of times. I can imagine. And I, I know a few, a few doctors, a few GPs have had negative, I mean, those without social media followings, that is, have had, have had some negative encounters with patients now that they're being seen in person again more frequently, etc., from a whether it's a conspiracy theory, whether it's vaccine related, whether it's just general discontent with the situation that's been directed at you, have you experienced a lot of that, some of that, or has it been elsewhere that that's been happening? Um, I personally, I haven't particularly. I mean, I've had um, I've had a couple of little things here and there, or, or knowledge of of, of maybe. Um, sort of I've seen it a bit you know or not like on my practice Facebook page actually but um I don't I haven't had any direct I've had a couple of, of gentle conversations with people you know who I know haven't been vaccinated for example like I've brought it up um but no not really I mean again I, I I have to say I'm so fortunate where I work the place that I work um my demographic of people are super lovely um and i you know I, I i don't i don't tend to get that much of, of that you know everywhere you'll get a little bit of stuff yeah yeah um, well that's good to hear because yeah. it's i can imagine as as a profession goes nobody's mental health has been tested as much as the medical profession has been over the course oh, I of know. i don't know it, it, it comes back it comes back to the personality I types think, i it? think i i honestly think if everybody's right i know and i would say this i would say that my mental health has been challenged in the last 12 months more than it has ever been challenged in my life, 100%. Um, however, I think that so many people can say that. And I think that the one thing that I have had that so many other people haven't had and the one thing that we've had in, in, in healthcare. And again, the, the other thing that I would say is I think hospitals have had it a lot harder than general practice, a lot harder than general practice. So they've really been at the, the coal face and the face to face treatment of sick patients with COVID. When in general practice, if somebody 
has COVID and is okay, they're okay and you don't need to do anything. If they're not okay, they need to go to hospital. There has not been a huge in between, except in places where the hospitals have been overwhelmed and then that has then spilled over into the issues for general practice. So again, that's regional, but I have been lucky from that point of view. But but I think, you know, what we have been lucky as that we our jobs have been 100% safe, safer than they've ever been. We have been able to go to work every day and see our colleagues and socialise, well, not socialise, but mix with interact people every think, yeah. day, interacting with people, seeing people. Um, and we've been, you know, everyone's been super grateful, m way more grateful during that period of time than than I think I've ever seen you know, in terms of support for the NHS. And, you know, I've had loads of discounts. I got my boiler repaired for free. <laughs> like, I've been treated like royalty. I can't, you know, I can't deny this. And, I, you know, like, like at the same time, yeah, it's been tough. But at the same time, other people have lost their jobs and have lost their families and have lost their savings and have lost their livelihoods and, and jobs that they that they held dear and that where their lives no longer exist and i know that happens throughout history but it's been quite concentrated so it's been, i would always hesitate to it, isn't it? yeah yeah i would just always hesitate to think that you know that i've been challenged any more than anybody else has i found it bloody hard like i'm not gonna lie but it's um yeah it, no. it, that's, I, I, that's, I, been more, and that's not even been from a job perspective that's just been from a pandemic perspective so everyone else has experienced that side of it as well so it, it's the, the the existential weight of it is is quite overbearing at points. I've I've struggled with it myself, and I think uh, what you did very well there is just sort of revert to neutrality rather than being overly positive or overly negative about things. Which is it's my the preference I try to implement when I look at things is, is try to objectify and be as neutral as possible about the reality of the situation in which we're in. Because as as we as we said, positivity isn't always the best option. Positivity sometimes can't be applied to the death of a loved one. But you can be neutral about the reality of it and then start to begin how to process what happens next. And I think that's why it, what you've done just there is just nice to hear because it's testament to the fact that you are, you're in the profession from a point of empathy rather than for other reasons. I mean, it's quite difficult to get through medical schools if you're purely financial driv financially driven, I can imagine. But it's, um, it's reassuring to hear that a GP cares about people. Who could have seen that coming? <laughs> yeah, well, I like to think so. And again, it's it's... You, you you do get you get weighed down by resources and your ability to again i think we, we touched on this before we started recording there are some situations where your ability to help people or your capacity to be able to help people isn't necessarily proportional to how much you want to help them and when that's mismatched that can be quite hard and i i find that quite hard and i think that sometimes and i think that what what i think healthcare professionals sometimes struggle with because I think I used to struggle with this perhaps I still do but when somebody asks you for help and you know you can't give them the help that they want because of whatever reason it's so easy to almost kind of see it, it can be adversarial because the situation is frustrating you so they're asking you for something you can't provide you get frustrated so you seem dismissive. And I, I think that that sort of level of communication is quite common in healthcare because a lot of people, their main complaint about their GP will be, my GP didn't listen to me. My GP wasn't interested. My GP didn't care. My GP didn't do anything. And it's, it's hard because there are sometimes situations where I'm sure that I will have come across in that way to people. And that's not reflective of how much I might care about that situation um but i think that that's why communication is so important because that doesn't come necessarily from what you do like, like i've spoken to people before who have said my old gp i've told my old gp about this and they didn't do anything and i've looked at their records and they will have had blood test blood test blood test blood test ct scan ultrasound scan x-ray um referral to three different specialties who have seen them done endoscopies colonoscopies all of these sorts of things and then found they've been normal um which in america would have cost a hundred and fifty thousand dollars perhaps exactly exactly and, and i think that it's very easy to to feel there's this there's this um that phrase people won't necessarily remember what you said but they'll remember how you made them feel and i think that it really applies to 
you know to communication in, in healthcare because you can do everything but if you don't demonstrate care it feels like nothing um and sometimes you know sometimes it will just be people being being unreasonable or having unrealistic expectations but sometimes it will just be a general impression that they didn't think that you cared and that's why they feel that you didn't do anything when actually you might have done a lot and you might have cared loads but you didn't demonstrate it because maybe you only had 10 minutes and you were too busy trying to think through what you were actually going to do and what tests do I need to do and all of this kind of stuff and it's super easy to just get you know to get caught up in that I think. The phrase you just used there is almost the crux of the turning point that I envision is the most valuable for the narrative around mental health in the sense that I've had talks from seeing talks by X amount of PhDs, the objectivity of why we feel miserable, why our chemical depression and chemical anxiety is X, Y, and Z, and why all the data points to this, that, and the other. But if the person delivering the information doesn't deliver it in a way that's human and allows you to actually understand and comprehend the reality of the facts and the figures on the screen in front of you or being shown to you or delivered to you, it's not going to stick. And I think this is this is especially the case in, in younger people because unless there is a person that they can apply the learnings that are being delivered to them to, they aren't going to be able to relate to the information being dispensed and therefore won't be able to apply the learnings themselves. And I think that's why I've found some, I'm tentative to use the word success, but some progress in terms of the narrative around my own mental health because all I do is place what is quite obvious in reality into the context of my own experience, which in turn allows other people's experiences to relate to it and therefore potentially take positive steps forward with their own lives. And I think that the phrase you use there is, is exactly, that's down to feeling. It, it's not necessarily what we say, but it's the feeling that goes with what you say. And I, uh, I think as a whole, as a society, there's a more of an understanding of that from an empathetic and a, a mental health point of view on a day-to-day -day basis. But as you said before, are we more aware or are we doing more to improve our mental health it, it's the golden question really isn't it it's the golden That's question the well, it, there, it, there's that whole thing between awareness and action isn't there that's a big thing on social media at the moment is yeah spreading awareness is great but what also what are we doing about it and i think that, that what you say is really important because i think on the whole scientific communicators and by that i include i guess you know people who are talking about mental health because i guess it's a science as well we don't always communicate so well with people because it's often quite academic um, and so people are less inclined to get their information from scientists and healthcare professionals are more inclined to get them from people who they can relate to and usually that ends up being you know people like influencers and, and stuff like that which you know is fine if their hearts are in the right place and they have made sure that they are educated and, and skilled enough to, to talk about the things they're talking about. And I think that's one of the biggest minefields is that, that, that what ends up happening is that everyone's encouraged so much to talk about mental health that then everyone like on social media thinks they should also be talking about mental health. So they talk about like they decide to talk about their struggles with mental health, but actually they haven't had any struggles necessarily with mental health so they're sort of again it leads to that increased pathologizing because they go yeah there was a you know i i used to be really terrified of doing this and then i overcame it by this that's not overcoming anxiety that's just normal human emotion and being worried about doing something that's challenging and then doing it and feeling better about it but then it leads people to feel a bit empty because they can't treat their depression by doing that and they can't treat their anxiety by doing that and then like i saw a post the other day that said something it was something like someone had been criticized for posting something about depression being a, i i choose is something like oh I, I know exactly what this was i had a few yeah. um i had a few comments typed out and decided you know what yeah it's marco robinson was his name yeah. and he's obviously used an app or paid for a whole load of his followers because he's not happy with the amount of attraction he gets for the fame that he believes he has with his 900 allegedly, views per video allegedly. yeah um, but, <laughs> so and, and it was something yeah so it's something like i i, I, I think a it, choice i choose it, ambition not yeah. depression or something like that or, 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 yeah. or whatever or, or motivational positivity or something like that and obviously you know that's a hugely flawed sentiment as you know i'm sure anyone who is listening to this podcast will will already know but 
what I thought was more interesting was that he had obviously received some criticism for it and, and he posted a video. Yeah, I, I and did in watch the video, this. So in the video, he said, well, you know, actually, I'm, I'm not going to delete this post because it's come from a real place and it's authentic. And, I'm, you know, I'm a massive advocate for mental health and, you know, mental health is very important to me and I've struggled with mental health. And I want, you know, anybody who's had mental health struggles, I'm happy for you to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you, et cetera, et cetera. You know, really, really positive. And then it went into explaining that depression, and I, 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 I'm i definitely, um, what's the word, embellishing, sort of extrapolating, no. Paraphrasing. I can't remember. Uh, paraphrasing, yeah. Um, I can help, by the like, way, as I remember this thank well. You. <laughs> yeah, depression is... Um, depression is a difference between your expectations a mismatch between your expectations of what should be happening and your reality of what is happening and i was like no that's not what depression is and the problem is i sort of again i went to half comment and i just thought uh there's there's uh, there's no point um but actually thinking back now maybe there is a point and actually that that was an opportunity perhaps to help um, and I didn't, I didn't help, but it's, it's testament to this situation where the Dunning-Kruger of people just like thinking that because they've done a diet, they're now a personal trainer, trainer or a nutrition coach, or because they've, you know, got a six pack, they can be an online coach or because they've, they've been a personal trainer, they can now be a business coach. And because they've had, they felt sad. Now they're a mental health advocate and reach out to, to, to me to talk about mental health and I'm like oh my goodness and then there's this other side of it where I think well maybe somebody talking about it to someone is better than nothing and you know the services available in some regions are you know aren't great but then I think actually the problem with mental health is that there is a risk of harm it's not just about being able to help or not being able to help it's about treating something with the knowledge that it deserves because if you don't you could actually cause harm to these people and leave them in a worse situation than if you just didn't say anything and the knock-on effect that that brings to those around them or even to the, the farthest extreme is the, is the potential loss that can come with that and um the the my biggest paraphrase learning from the roman, Co roman kemp documentary was something that joe's mum said in it who was the the friend that the documentary was made for? Was that the pain isn't the pain doesn't disappear? It's simply transferred, which made me raise my eyebrows when she said it because it was almost going down that dangerous line of suicide selfish, which wasn't what was being said. It was more just the the reality that the pain. When it comes back to my personal experience with it, I had I was conscious. I, I didn't consciously decide to die. I just wanted peace. But I managed to repress the, the reality that that piece was just the volume going up on somebody else's speakers elsewhere, if, if that's what I achieved. Thankfully, it isn't, but it, that, that was a fascinating th thing for me to consider. So when I saw the post that you were talking about the other day, I, I, I honestly just didn't have the energy to engage because I just knew what direction he'd take. And I was going to go down the line of, well, if you're as solid and infallible and just as resilient as you think you are, then I'll quite happily run up a hill with you for a, <laughs> or something like that because he was just it, it was the conviction with what he was with with which he was saying what he was saying in that I'm really successful and I'm in good shape therefore I have fixed my depression just that narrative is just it's just so damaging especially from a masculine point of view because that is the exact thing that is causing men to feel depressed in the first place and his sign off for that apology quote unquote for anyone listening I'm quoting with my hands because I'm being very dramatic about this was get busy living or get busy dying and as a sign off for what was meant to be an apology for what is ultimately a human challenge it is just so ignorant to the reality of the of the situation in, in that somebody is struggling to effectively live a happy life so just do something different it's just the the, the ignorance and the lack of compassion and the lack of empathy that goes with what is a very complex issue and it's easy you know to what? say from his position. I don't want to say exactly. that be, because he's because he's well off and seemingly famous. But I say again, get six hundred views per video, which is very odd for somebody with one hundred fifty thousand followers. Um, <laughs> I had a lot up my sleeve, um, <laughs> but it's just 
anybody you can be as wealthy as you want you can be you can struggle with your mental health you can be as in good shape as you want you can struggle with your mental health you're arguably more susceptible to it but it's the lack of understanding that goes with as you said before it's exposure to other people and, and the fact that you're this is why i'm always so careful never to prescribe anything when it comes to my experience with mental health because i am fergus you are mike he is dickhead and it's just a case Allegedly. of yes 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 it's just it, it's just understanding that nuance but something i was trying to try and say is it, it's very difficult to understand somebody's experience with depression you don't actually necessarily need to you just need to be able to be able to, to understand how you can support it and how to do that proactively but for somebody seeing that that's feeling a certain way they might think even worse about the fact that they're not working as hard as they could be or going to the gym as often as they could be and it's just a perpetual spiral from that point and, and I think that what what is the it is a hard message to deliver, and I think this is where people go wrong. And I, I don't know that he was trying to deliver this message, but this is the, the message that I want to kind of pretend that he was trying to deliver. It's hard to explain to people that there are positive things that you can do to improve your situation, without saying it's your fault that you're in this situation. I do think that's that's a genuinely hard to articulate sort of sort of thing because if somebody's already feeling quite, you know, fragile and sensitive and, and upset about it and, and thinking that it's their fault, it's quite difficult to, to explain, you know, like things that they could do or that there are improvements that can be made. Because there are you know, there are these little one percent things that, that we all talk about all the time, like, you know, um, Sometimes they might be medication, sometimes they might be journaling, sometimes they might be therapy, sometimes they might be having a bath. You know, all of these things that seem so minute and that, that might have an impact. It's hard to say you could do this without looking like you're saying it's your fault if you're, you know, if you're feeling like this. Unfortunately, I think sometimes it does literally come out as, oh, it's your fault, just fix it. You know, and yeah, why don't you just do this? And this is the why don't you, the why don't you just is probably one of the worst opening sentence of any sentence that you can say to anybody who's in any sort of life situation that they are struggling in because if it was just they'd have already done it agreed agreed and that that's it's so nuanced i mean we've said we've said it so many times but it's just why don't we just think differently about it eh? but it's <laughs> it, hey, it, it's, it's 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 the individuality, I think, is the narrative that's missing. I think it's the every mainstream media outlet is trying to say this is the solution. Every person online that's trying to sell something for it is trying to sell that as a solution. I get asked, oh, do you not take antidepressants? Why not? Because I've actually managed to find a way out of my situation without them, but that's not inherently demonizing them by me not having used them and vice versa. So it's a very complex narrative, but I think the I, we, we, we did dip our toes in that rabbit hole earlier. And I'm kind of annoyed that we did because it's probably just fueling the fire that he wants. But nonetheless, that narrative as a whole is the one that I fell into the trap of when I was suffering, which is why it wound me up so much, but why I was so keen to disengage from it because yeah. I, I, I just want to try and detach away from that narrative as a whole. And, and the other side of things is that actually in reality, I sometimes look at people who think that and I think, gosh, how, how lucky and privileged it must be to have to have never suffered any more than you can just think your way out of like yeah. how lucky brilliant i hope that that stays that way in your life forever because if it does you're sorted if it doesn't i hope that you manage to have access to people who will explain why without you completely falling apart and i think that's that's what's what's tough with it and ambition just to, to engage in a bit more semantics ambition is ultimately what was my downfall because my ambitions weren't being fulfilled which made me feel like a failure. And because my ambitions were so black and white, I'd failed. That was it. What do I do now? And this is where so many men that work in the city, so many men that work in sport, women as well. I mean, it, it's I'm, I'm using men in that example because we are so much more self-destructive when it comes to actually discussing this sort of thing. But the, the generalized narrative is that if you have high ambitions, there is high pressure, there is high stress, the stakes are slightly higher if you do push those ambitions, and that means that you've got further to fall, potentially. And if you fall short, you might interact with yourself internally very negatively, and that can start to lead to depression. So, yeah, I don't choose any one thing to solve this crisis, as I don't have all the answers, is, is kind of the, the, the executive summary I'd give it. But it's, it's just a... 
I, I think the parameters have started to shift. I think awareness conversation is much more developed. I think there's still areas of the UK where it can be massively improved. There's still corners of sport where it can be massively improved. There's still a lot that can be done in the education system, but progress is progress, and I think it's happening. And um, we've we've had a challenging eighteen months, haven't we? But I feel like people have learned, and I hope it sticks. I really do hope it sticks. But I feel like people have learned a lot more about themselves and what's actually truly meaningful to them in the past eighteen months. It, 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 even me, as somebody who felt quite self aware, has learned even more of those things recently. But I think um, before we go. The final thing that I probably would ask, and it seems strange from a non-prescriptive point of view, but what are the what are the lowest hanging fruits that you think most people most people get wrong in their data? Like, from, from a generalized perspective, I know you don't, I know you don't like to generalize, but from a generalized perspective, what are the lowest hanging fruits that most people fall short on when it comes to allowing their mental health to flourish? Whether it's sleep, whether it's uh, uh, the obvious stuff, but the obvious stuff is almost the stuff that's most easily misplaced, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you can you can probably bundle it all up in self-care, um, which I know is such a massive buzz sort of phrase at the moment. And it, it's tough because, again, it, it's one of those things that's just been totally bastardised by the Internet as well. Because what does self-care mean? Oh, chocolate. Like, that's lush, really what it lush means. bubble bath bombs. Um, yeah, but I think self-care to me is... Um, and this is this so this was something that I need to credit it to really to Kimberly Wilson, who's an amazing psychologist who's written an incredible book called How to Build a Healthy Brain, which I absolutely love. I haven't read that. Um, it's behind I will me there. Get involved. It's really good. Um and basically she describes self care as self parenting, basically. And it's it's such a good example because like, you know, if you're trying to look after a child, you're gonna give them treats, but you're not gonna give them too many treats. You're gonna, you know, make sure they get enough sleep. You're going to make sure they get enough nutrition. You're going to make sure they get enough play time. You're going to make sure they get enough rest rest time. You're also going to make sure they go to school. You're going to make sure they eat their vegetables. You know, like it's it's a really good way of thinking about like you're actually it's you trying to look after somebody, a person, but that person is yourself. It's not about giving yourself a break. Sometimes, of course, it is. Sometimes it's about giving yourself less of a break. Um, and I think that's sort of what you know, what gets it what gets it wrong checking in with yourself making sure that you're okay all of those sorts of things as well like i would even say like stuff like journaling i'm sure is very powerful i have not managed to engage with it myself but and there's so fine. many of these and things like, like i kind of <laughs> refer to these things as these little one percenters because you know like again you if you're feeling depressed a bath is not going to resolve it but a bath might make you feel one percent better in in that sort of environment or in that sort of like context a walk might make you feel another percent better meeting up with a friend another percent and then cumulatively you might end up with five percent or ten percent or even twenty and actually anything is better than nothing when you are feeling not great um, and the more that you embed those things into your habits I think so one of the things that I think that we really saw in lockdown was people suddenly out of the blue being hit by feeling low or anxious because all of the things that they automatically did, which was which were those, you know, going to the pub with their mates, going out, meeting someone for coffee, which you don't think of as like a positive mental health practice. It's just what we do. It's our schedule. Oh, I'm free on a Thursday. Do you want to meet up for a coffee? You go for a coffee. You have a whinge about your job. You go to the job. You go to the pub after work. You have a whinge with all your work colleagues about the pub. This debrief before you go home. You know, all of those little things that people weren't doing anymore and suddenly didn't know why they didn't feel great anymore and it was you know partly partly you know because of, of, of the existential side of things but partly because all of those little mechanisms that were built into their daily routine had suddenly been taken away and they were only being replaced with netflix or hit sessions in the living room which was <laughs> the other alternative wasn't it but self-parenting is a fantastic way of putting it i'm definitely gonna read that book off the back of that it's a fantastic concept and there's somebody somewhere having a bowl of cocoa pot for dinner listening to this thinking maybe they were right. I thought this was self-care. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go and have a bowl of Cocoa Pops for dinner. But no, Same. thank you thank you, uh, thank you, you very much, Mike. Really enjoyed that. And it's uh, oh, great to get an insight from uh, from somebody with as upstanding a career as yourself. And I, oh, I hope you'll, you. you'll, you'll be shedding more insights this weekend in IFS, won't you? Yes, I'm very excited for that. Very excited. Cool. Enjoy. Thanks again. Thanks very much.